So, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Sergio Peñafiel. I'm a computer scientist. I'm a master in computer science from Chile. I work for a cancer institute in Chile. I do research there. And this presentation is about a uh, work we did this year. It's very recent. Uh, about uh, predicting the pathology complete response to new adjuvant uh, treatment for HER2 positive breast cancer. Uh, using the interpretable regression, a little <laughs> long title, but <laughs> uh, that expressed what we did. Uh, first, I, I would like to um, um, tell you that our team, which are listed there, it's multidisciplinary. We have some oncologists like Isabel Safi and Inti Paredes. We also have uh, biostatisticians, right? like Rodrigo Lagos and Paulo Luz, and the rest of us are just uh, data scientists, computer science. So in this work, we, we actually have uh, many different um, actors. So first, uh, this is about breast cancer. Um, breast cancer is one of the most common cancer uh, worldwide. Uh, in this chart, you can see that uh, in 2020, uh, breast cancer was the most common type of cancer. Uh, according to the Globocan, which is one of the largest cancer observatories that uh, monitors cancer uh, around the globe, right? And uh, breast cancer um, has some subtypes, right? There are four main subtypes of breast cancer. Uh, first, there is the luminal-like breast cancer, which is the most well-differentiated and easy to, to treat. Then we have the triple negative breast cancer, the HER2 positive breast cancer, which is what we are talking about, and the metastatic uh, breast cancer. So after the breast cancer is diagnosed, you have this uh, subdivision, and we are focusing on one of these subtypes, the HER2 positive. And um, we are exploring a new adjuvant treatment. New adjuvant treatment means that uh, chemotherapy is done before the, the surgery. This is uh, contrary to what we have been done uh, in the last decades, because usually we have the uh, normal adjuvant uh, treatment, which is uh, having the surgery to extract most of the tumor, and then apply chemotherapy to the rest of the remainder of the tumor that has after the surgery to kill the, the, the last cancer cells there. But a new adjuvant treatment is a new technique that applies chemotherapy before the surgery to shrink the tumor to make it easier to, to extract with a, a surgical uh, treatment. So this is uh, something new that started like five years ago to become more popular, and um, it's still unknown for oncologists when they are when they receive a patient, right, which is HER2 positive breast cancer diagnosis. Uh, if we uh, are able to apply this procedure, like the new adjuvant, or should we uh, use the classical, the traditional adjuvant procedure? So this is the main question we would like to answer. Uh, and that means uh, predicting the pathological complete response, which is uh, if the treatment was successful, uh, the, the pathologic, uh, a pathologic response is when you uh, perform a treatment to a patient and it produces some response. The response can be partial, so that the tumor is uh, less aggressive or smaller, right? Or the response can be complete, which is when you extract all the tumor and then you um, could state that the patient is cured by this treatment. So we are interested in predicting the complete pathological response because the for the partial pathological uh, response, we, is, we know that the other treatment is, is, is useful. So uh, we would like to find the patient that, ha, that after this treatment um, cure the, the cancer, right? 
And more importantly than having like uh, this prediction, uh, as you can may imagine, this is a binary uh, classification problem between the classes having pathological complete response or not. And, but most importantly than this prediction between these two classes are uh, the factors that uh, each class or each group uh, have in common, the patterns, right? That uh, explain why some patient e will have a pathological complete response. So to answer the first question, that is when a patient comes to an oncologist and have an appointment, the oncologist may suggest the new adjuvant treatment to, to them. So here we see an opportunity to apply interpretable classification, right, to solve um, this problem. So here are the challenges, as I mentioned. Uh, the first one is to uh, develop a binary classifier to uh, between the classes have pathological complete response or not. The second one is to identify the most important rules of each class, right? And we have a third uh, extra challenge that is a, a test uh, whether the full schema of chemotherapy is needed for the treatment or not. Yeah. Um, well. Uh, in chemotherapy, you usually um, treat the patient by applying some drugs uh, to them, right? Um, usually, there, is, uh, there are more than one uh, drug, right? That is uh, a set of drugs is called an, an schema in chemotherapy. So, uh, the uh, usual uh, literature experience said that the new adjuvant um, Chemotherapy is done by the combination of these two drugs, the trastuzumab and pertuzumab. Uh, but recent studies have shown that only applying trastuzumab is enough to achieve the com pathology complete response. So we would like to also uh, test if this is true for our patient and what are, uh, uh, are the characteristics, right? Uh, so for this, we need data, of course, patients. And uh, we gather information of, for 390 patients from eight different hospitals in Spain, Portugal, and Chile uh, that, was, uh, that were treated with the full schema, the trastuzumab and pertuzumab drugs, right? Uh, for these uh, patients, we have nine attributes that are listed here, that are mainly demographics and immunostochemic uh, variables, uh, that are the age, the menopausal status, the clinical TNM, the stage of the cancer at the diagnosis, uh, the differentiation grade of the tumor. Um, then we have the um, Test for fluorescence and receptors in the in the tumor cells that are estrogen receptor, progesterone receptors, and the Ki E67 index, right? And I would like to make a pause here because uh, to 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 actually understand this, we have only uh, we have less than 400 patients, right? We have nine attributes. Our data set is small, right? We have few rows and few attributes, but this is what we can, uh, could collect, right? We, we don't have access to more than this information, even when we ask a different hospital to provide the information. Uh, because every one of these patients are, like I said, they are breast cancer, HER2 positive, treated with new adjuvant uh, uh, chemotherapy, and uh, we know the result of the treatment. So it's very specific, the cohort of the patient we are uh, using for these problems. And so, um, so we have this small uh, data set that puts some limitation in the work, as we can see after. And uh, extracting the information was not an easy task, neither. 
uh, because uh, the, these eight different hospitals have different information systems, for example, or different, uh, uh, for example, clinical services. So for some of them uh, don't have imaging in their institution, they uh, have to refer to another one, and so on. So we have these uh, uh, three main sources of data which are the medical records, which is the, the, um, the reports that the clinicians uh, done when they are uh, consulting the patient, right? So this is in free text form, mainly. We have imaging and we have the pathology uh, reports from the biopsy. Uh, as I said, all of these institutions have different systems, so we need to uh, process all of this information. We uh, perform uh, an automatic uh, feature extraction process, but then these, these features were validated by the expert, the oncologist we have in the team, and we end up with this tabular data set, right? And for this problem, uh, we will apply uh, the um, Dempster Sheffer classifier, the famous one that uh, Nelson previously introduced. Uh, this is a rule-based classifier, right? You have to put some rules and the classifier will uh, operate these rules according to the dempster Sheffer theory and tell us what are the most important rules, what are the less important rules. And uh, according to the data that we provide in the training phase, we uh, can optimize the values of the masses so the classifier uh, learn which are important and which are not. Yeah, another uh, kind of handy feature for us is that the classifier can handle missing values because uh, even when we try to have the most uh, um, complete data set, we have some missing values. So, uh, and the classifier can, can handle that. So there is no problem there. And, um, as Nelson previously mentioned also, we have a, a rule in the, in the classifier is this. It's the combination of one a condition, a statement that we can prove to be true or false with the data, with a record, and a mass assign function. And a mass assign function is the a assignation of these so-called masses to the power set of the outcomes of a problem. Right, so in our uh, case, we have these two classes, uh, pathology complete response and not pathology complete response, and then we have another one that is the uncertainty. So uh, for each rule, we have these three values that, uh, that in the beginning, they are assigned random, and then in the training process, the model learns or optimizes, adjusts these values to the, op their optimal value. Um, these rules, as, as, as this said in the bottom, can be uh, done by manually inputting these rules. So, I mean, the, you have to define them, or you can let the method to, to define them. Uh, in our case, we define the rules as we have few attributes we can uh, do that. And um, we mostly use one attribute rules. That means that in the statement, only one attribute is uh, considered in the, uh, at a time, right? Uh, most of our uh, attributes are categorical, so we can do a rule for each category, very straightforward. And uh, for the H and the KI index, uh, we split according to what the experts said that are the best split for that variables. Uh, in the H, we, we use like some normal ranges for young, adult, and senior people. Um, for the KI 67 index, uh, they said that the only uh, need, uh, thing that they need to know is is, is positive, which means that it is uh, presenting more than the 50, 20 percent of the cells, or negative, right? Uh, and we uh, uh, include some two attribute uh, rules uh, for them for the receptors, for example, that are the, like the most informative variables. After this, 
the model has 86 uh, rules, right? Not so much, but remember we have a, a small data set, so we cannot go crazy with the number of rules because the model can, uh, cannot learn this, these values. Um, well, as Nelson said in the previous slide, uh, presentation, the Dempster Shepherd classifier works like this. After you define your set of rules, the 86 rules that I said before, uh, if you try to predict one record, uh, the X vector in there, uh, you have to first select which rules are true for this record. After that, you can combine them using the Dempster rule, which is what the, the Dempster Shepherd theory um, uh, has like a, a combination rule for, for different mass assign functions. And this produces the one uh, mass for the combination, and then you estimate the probability when one, and you uh, output that as the class, as the predicted class for the model. So um, we did a threefold um, cross validation. Um, process over this data set, and we compare uh, these to other ma traditional machine learning classifiers like a decision tree, uh, k nearest neighbors, gradient boosting, and super vector matching. Right? Uh, the results are here, not so well <laughs> as you may see. So, um, the our model, which is called the SGD. Um, in terms of accuracy and uh, the area under the rock curve and F1 scores, uh, is um, mostly the first one. It outperforms in certain way the other one, but the, uh, the accuracy is still very low, right? 60%. And as you can see in the confusion matrix, there are a lot of um, false positives there. Um, and a certain like bias to to the complete complete response uh, class. Uh, this is more obvious when you see the rock curve. Um, as you can see, uh, yes, our model is over the the other ones, the blue line, right? Um, but um, this is just uh, better to run, right? This is not like a super accurate classifier. So. Uh, but anyway, we can see the rules produced by the model for the two of this class. And for the uh, no PCR class, um, we can see the first four rules, and for the PCR class, also the first four rules. And the first thing that you may notice is the uncertainty in the last column. The uncertainty is high, it's super high. So. Even the, uh, that's a good thing because the model tells you, it's, it's transparent in that way that said that, okay, this is the most important rule, but uh, this is highly uncertain for, for the model. So, um, so the results are expected in this uncertainty value, but even um, um, with these uh, rules, we can uh, check if they are uh, correct or they make sense to, um, to the oncologist. So we did that and we asked them, okay, these are the results of the model. Uh, this makes sense to you. Um, for example, the first uh, rule said that the, the two receptors are positives, right? So have a positive expression. And uh, that usually means that there, there is an heterogeneous tumor. Right? And when you have an heterogeneous tumor, usually one, like super specific treatment like this one, uh, don't work. So uh, that's, that makes sense for the oncologist. So this is expected. Um, the next one, um, when you have like um, a high chi67 index, the, the contrary to what the, the um, uh, the rule states the tumor is more aggressive. And in this kind of treatments, uh, if you can remember, uh, we apply the chemotherapy first to shrink the, the tumor. So we, uh, a more aggressive tumor is actually better for the complete 
a pathological response than a, than a not so aggressive because the, the chemotherapy will work in, in more aggressive tumors. And if we have a low a KI67 index, that means that the tumor is not so aggressive, so it's not multiplying that fast uh, the cells, right? Uh, so the chemotherapy may not work. And that makes sense also for the non-PCR uh, class. In the, in the PCR class, uh, we see a rule uh, similar to the previous one, uh, stage three. Uh, stage three means uh, uh, an advanced cancer, right? An advanced cancer are uh, usually um, uh, associated with the aggressivity of the cancer. So uh, stage three, uh, and if it's aggressive, then the treatment will work. So this, uh, rules all, this rule also makes sense. And, but the most important rule for the uh, PCR class, which said that the premenopausic status, uh, um, I mean, the women with premenopausic status have a better uh, pathologic complete response. This rule is contradictory to what uh, experts usually tend to know, right? So, because um, they have seen that um, the, when you are in this state, the hormones are, uh, levels are different, and they don't expect to have a pathologic complete response in this case. But this is something interesting because, as I said in the beginning, uh, oncologists have some ideas of why, when this works, but no, they are not completely sure. This rule, which is the most important rule for the complete response, uh, challenge their, uh, their knowledge, their current knowledge about the problem. And even if, they, if when we present them, they say, no, this doesn't make sense completely at all, maybe there uh, is worth to try to make a study and say if this is true or not. Right? So this is one of the nice things when you have these interpretable results to, to, to not explain all of these uh, results, but some of them um, can be conducted to further studies. Yeah, that's that's what I mean. I, I we in this uh, in in with this result, we are not sure if this is uh, caused by random because of the data, because we have higher uncertainty, or it is actually a factor that uh, produces complete pathologic response. So we need to conduct further studies with patients, right? Separating patients in two cohorts, do the all the statistics to know if this is true or not, right? It, on, the, the only conclusion from this is that we don't know if this is true or not, but it's worth uh, trying. So in all cases, then, Dr. Shepard says that these rules have a lot of uncertainty, so mm. we can't rely on In all cases? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, all of these rules suffer from this, like, a kind of, we don't know if it was random or, or it's actually a pattern, but for all of the other ones, they have an explanation, so they, in, it, it is an insight that maybe this is true. Uh, the model is, is learning what, uh, the, uh, what the current knowledge knows about the problem, but in this case, this is was the only rule that doesn't make sense. Yeah, so moving to the next part of the problem uh, is to, to, to know if partial chemotherapy schemas uh, work, right? Um, this is important because you may wonder why uh, this is a problem, uh, but this is important because uh, the pertuzumab, uh, which is the, the other drug that is applied in the schema, uh, it's relatively new. Trastuzumab is uh, in the in the pharma for 20 years or so, but pertuzumab is, is, is new. So in Chile, for example, we need to import this drug from Europe. So we don't have a, a access, or the access is limited to, to this drug. 
Also, applying a new drug to a patient that doesn't need it uh, has uh, other, um, um, other problems, like, for example, toxicity. Uh, every time you apply a chemotherapy drug, you suffer from headaches or stomachache or, or, any, or other symptoms, right? And also, uh, it's, uh, it lowers the cost, right? If you are not using one drug that is super expensive, uh, the, the insurance will be very happy. Uh, and, and, many, and in many cases, insurance plans doesn't, uh, don't cover this kind of uh, drug, so the patient has to pay. Um, so we can extend the previous uh, result to this new uh, problem, and in this case, we need patients that has um, the complete schema and orders that has the partial schema. So in this case, we have fewer um, patients, right? Because not all of these hospital institutions uh, do the, the partial schema chemotherapy. Uh, but uh, the good thing is that we now have more attributes. We have uh, like the body mass index, the histological type, uh, and some other um, uh, pathological uh, uh, variables. And the way we um, the way we introduced this uh, kind of partial schema was uh, as a new variable for the the data set, right? So we have uh, uh, the variables of the patient and one final column, for example, that tells you if received the full schema or not, right? And we test many many modelings, but this is what this is the the what uh, work the best. We did the same setup, uh, threefold color specification, and compared to the other models, the results are similar to the previous one. So we have a precision about uh, sorry for it in Spanish, uh, a precision about 61. Um, uh, I mean accuracy, and the rock curves is better than random again. The confusion matrix now has a more um, like uh, false positives there, um, but um, what is interesting is to see uh, this um, the impact of having a partial schema versus a complete schema. So as we introduce the schema as a column, a new attribute for our data set. In the test set, we can change the value of the schema. So for example, if a patient in, he actually received a full schema, we can change that to, uh, to make the same record for a partial schema and tell the model, okay, predict now this value. And we obviously expect to this to to worsen the, the prediction, the accuracy, and that's what we, this uh, chart um, shows. Uh, we see uh, the confusion matrix again, and in the arrows are the, the percentage of records that moves from one uh, category to the other when we tweak this, uh, when we switch this uh, schema. So we expect to, have more uh, false, uh, uh, false positive or false negative results because um, uh, changing the schema should change the pathology complete response. So uh, this is the way we measure that. And it actually is what uh, happened. Uh, if we see the, the arrows, the most of them, the, uh, the, the the 40, uh, 14 that eight percent of the true positive uh, records change to false negative when we change the complete schema with the partial schema. So, for all of these patients, that, what that means is for 14 uh, percent of the patients of the test set, uh, the partial schema uh, would not work, right? According to the model. And uh, the, you can perform the, the, the other way. Uh, five, I mean, um, eight dot four percent of the patient from move from true negative to false positive when we change the partial schema to the full schema. So that means that eight percent of these patients 
if, if we would apply the the full schema, they would have a, had a complete pathologic response. So, so the model um, um, cannot see this interaction with the schema, and this is the way, the preliminary way that we have matched. Um, well, we deploy this as a web application <laughs> because we need to show, show our, 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 our research somehow. And uh, uh, it's very simple, it's online. Uh, you put the, the variables of the model, the model uh, runs in the, in the background, and it provides you the, uh, the probabilities of PCR for the full schema and the partial schema. So, uh, we see that uh, Dempster search effort classifier um, achieved the best performance uh, in this experiment, but the performance was very low. So the classifier may need uh, more data or uh, more attributes to work well, right? Um, some of the rules were validated, as we said before, some other not, that may need uh, for their studies, but they may give us the first insight of the model. Uh, pr uh, prior to this work, there is no other work uh, using machine learning for neo adjuvant treatment, right? Only a statistics uh, analysis or something like that. This is the first machine learning uh, attempt to this problem, right? And well, the, the last part, the model uh, validates that the impact of the having a full or partial schema um, exists, but maybe not uh, in the way in the in the way that oncologists uh, believe, right? The, because we see like 15% of patients that most move, so that's not a huge amount. So maybe they have, they they can consider partial schemas as well. And um, yeah, that ends the presentation. Yeah? You had uh, three classes of very good textual data. Yeah? You have three classes of textual data. So they are, so yeah, they are the sources of the, the, yeah, the, the sources of mm. your data. Yeah. Yeah. Three of them are necessary for the old patients, or this, or we have some patients that have only textual data and no other data. Or no other data. How do you put them these three together? Yeah. We <coughs> yeah. This is what uh, we had in the beginning. The free text from the medical report, the imaging and the pathology report. So we process this information uh, with a feature extraction process, which is main, mainly uh, using regular expressions, for example, for free text to identify some specific terms that, uh, that give us this information. Uh, but after all, this is not the part of the, uh, this is not what the model sees. Uh, this was done uh, before uh, training the model. So this is like the pre-processing process of the, um, of the data. Uh, we start with that, we perform this feature extraction, we validate with the expert, but we end up with a table. And this table is the input for the model. Uh, most of them, yes, but in different like formats or, or or, or because we have information from different hospitals. So for example, if one hospital has one imaging system in their institution, the other one has another one. So they, they report information in, in different formats. We need to address that problem to unify this information. So all of these processes was done before the, the, the training and the classification. Yes? Um, any chance to get more data and see whether yeah. you 
Yeah, uh, yeah. This is the this is the problem that we have uh, no uh, so much record, but it it is not an easy task because each one each of the rows of the data set is a real patient that have this kind of cancer that had this treatment and we know the result. So it is very specific. Um, even when we ask eight different hospitals to provide us information, we end up with this uh, number of, of patients. So we would like to have more hospitals to get more, more data, but, but it's not, so, it not so easy. Thanks for the presentation. Um, I have two questions. One is about the evaluation that you showed about the F1 score. Um, so you use the classifier and you use the F1 for the uh, accuracy, right? Mm. So um, that ignores the true negatives. So that means you are not looking at the tr uh, correctly classified PCRs. Mm. So I would suggest not to use F1 score at all. Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, that depends on w how to use the, the, the classifier for, right? If we are using for uh, predicting the, which patient uh, applies from, for the new adjuvant treatment, then yes, maybe the F1 score is not suitable for that. But if we use it for, for example, discard the patients that are, we, we are mostly sure that they, they will not have a BCR, I, then maybe the F1 score uh, makes sense in, in this situation. That's why we report them, it, but uh, yes, it, it's not the only, the only metric that we uh, compute for performance. Okay, and my second question is about the data that you have. So most of the uh, PCR classification uses the genetical levels for the uh, prediction, whether you are PCR or you still have uh, disease. So I'm wondering if you, if you have uh, genetical information, would your method provide better results? Uh, yeah, it might provide better results, but um, in the, in this, this is the first attempt to this problem, so we uh, try to make it the uh, most simple as possible. But yes, we can explore uh, using uh, uh, this, uh, the feature in a more raw form. 